Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer, and I'm at the Science and Non-Duality Conference in San Jose, California, which is an annual pilgrimage for me for the past six years. And um, I'm honored to be speaking right now with Hamid Ali and Karen Johnson. I'll just give a little biographical sketch of each one. Uh, we're going to be speaking about non-dual relationships. So Hamid, um, perhaps better known as Age Alma is his pen name, was born in the Middle East, but at age 18 moved to the U.S. to study at the University of California in Berkeley. And incidentally, I've interviewed Hamid twice, so if you're watching this online, or those of you here in the audience who would like to see the previous interviews, you can find them there. He was working on his PhD in physics, um, where he was studying Einstein's theory of general relativity and nuclear physics, when he reached a turning point in his life and destiny that led him more and more into inquiring into the psychological and spiritual aspects of human nature. Hamid is the founder of the Diamond Approach, a spiritual teaching that utilizes a unique kind of inquiry into realization, where the practice is the expression of realization. This inquiry opens up the infinite creativity of our being, transforming our lives into a runaway realization, moving from realization to further realization. <clears throat> Hamid's books include The Inner Journey Home, Essence, The Pearl Beyond Price, Luminous Night Journey, and The Unfolding Now. Karen Johnson participated, whom I've also interviewed on back, yeah, participated in the development of the Diamond Approach with Hamid uh, since the 1970s. She has been teaching in the U.S. and Europe for 35 years. She has an M.A. in psychology and trained as an artist and dancer. She has an interest in true spirit of scientific investigation based on the love for truth. The underlying truth that manifests through the beauty and order of the physical and spiritual universe has been a motivating force in her life. So, um, Hamid and Karen wrote a book called Divine Eros, and um, in light of that book, we're going to be talking about non-dual relationships, which in a way, it's sort of an oxymoron or a contradiction in terms, you know, when you say non-dual relationships, because non-dual implies one, and relationships implies more than one. Um, but the great famous non-dualists, all the ones that I can think of, uh, were very devotional people. Um, you know, Shankara said, the intellect imagines duality for the sake of devotion. And he wrote beautiful devotional poetry, even though he was the great sort of founder of, of non-duality. Um, uh, Ramana Maharshi is famous <laughs> for his devotion to a mountain, actually to Lord Shiva embodied in a mountain, Arunachala. Um, Nisargadatta, after giving his non-dual talks would, and half the people would leave, he'd break into you know, ra raucous bhajans and, and perform pujas and all sorts of devotional practices. And almost every you know, traditional non-dual teacher like that had a, a guru uh, who, to whom he was devoted, not only in terms of his knowledge and, and service, but also his emotional, his love. And yet we just referred to um, three people who were all monks, and most of us are not monks, um, and you don't live in monasteries, and are engaged in, <coughs> or want to be engaged in, uh, <laughs> relationships with um, you know, our peers, our you know, fellow men and women. And so how do we reconcile our quest for enlightenment and non-dual realization with the complexities and, uh, you know, challenges of um, relation, human relationships? I imagine that's one of the things we'll be talking about here. Um, and maybe that's a good starting point. How would you like to respond to that? I think it's exciting. Exciting? Yeah. yeah. To think about how from that ground that we know as the unity and mm -hmm. oneness, each of us express that differently. Even when we're in a state of non-duality, we call it that, we're still aware that it's our experience. So it's coming through each individual consciousness. And if you're feeling that oneness, it doesn't necessarily mean the person next to you is feeling it, although you know it's their nature. You know that they could have access to it, but there's something about the fact that there's an individual consciousness that is part of that oneness, that's expressing itself. And that's the beauty of 
really learning about what it means to be a real human being in the world and having contact that isn't separated from that ground. That there's a, a way that the consciousness is a, a living consciousness that has qualities. Not, it's not just this kind of gray consciousness that's just knowledge and everything knows every, you know, that there's knowledge and it's got qualities of intelligence and um, strength and will and, you know, there's many colors and flavors to that consciousness and the way it comes through us in life are real qualities, qualities of consciousness, living consciousness and that can interact with another living being and the more we're in touch with that unity that ground the more we can open to and become a conduit for those qualities to come through but not just as an openness that's one possibility that we're just open and it can come through but as a personalness like as I'm talking to you I feel like I'm nakedly here and in contact with you that there's an in-touchness, but it's personal. Mm -hmm. And so we need to understand what it is to have individual consciousness that's not separated from that ground. And that consciousness develops in a way that allows us to have a sense of personalness without being a cookie cutter person. It's a consciousness that's a, f a true form of, of humanness. And when those two human beings that are in touch, it's like when those tips of the iceberg, of which we are all, you know, really grounded underneath in consciousness, when those tips begin to actually acknowledge one another in their fullness and totality, that can create the, the, du the, the appeared dual nature of relationship is actually just the individual expression of that ground. And that's when the sparks can fly or the, the differences can become interesting rather than divisive and exchanges are enriching and valuable. Let me just throw something in quick before, based on what you said before Hamid responds, because um, before, because I'll forget it. But um, it seems to me that what people are seeking in relationship is a kind of a union uh, and an intimacy. and. Mm -hmm. uh, using your iceberg analogy, um, you know, the, ice, the tips of two icebergs can't actually meet if it's just the tips. And, you know, but the, the sort of the larger iceberg, maybe the two tips are actually part of the same iceberg, just sticking yeah. up in different places. And if people could recognize their fundamental unity with everyone else, you know, that namaste means I recognize that part of you, which is part of me or whatever. There's a, we're, we're actually the same person expressing through different instruments. Mm -hmm. If then you can have actual in intimacy where there's total union. Right, well that's actually fulfills that desire. necessary. That's why going inward and knowing what you are is a significant component of what it means to have a real relationship. That you have to be willing to be alone. If you're just going for relationship to avoid aloneness, you can't really know that inner sanctum that you need to be able to be alone in your nature and know it for what it is for that to express itself personally. Mm -hmm. So it's like a tip of an iceberg that says, yes, I want a relationship, is trying to head for the other peak <laughs> and they can't get there. Right. And so it means settling into that deep water and feeling the fact that one's aloneness actually is the connection. Mm -hmm. And then that can be expressed in many ways. Nice. Hamid, do you want to respond to that? Well, I know when you mentioned the various uh, non-dualists and, and how they were, had a bhakti connection, I also remember that you didn't mention that some of them were married. Mr. Gadar Maharaj had a wife. Right. Yeah. And Atmananda wasn't only married, he was okay. very devoted to his wife. Mm -hmm. And so he wondered how, how, you know, how Nobody, I don't know if anybody asked them, how do you feel about your wife, <laughs> right? But uh, I remember one time when I was into non-duality and experiencing learning, uh, waking up one night, waking up my wife and telling her, you know, you're only a figment of my imagination. 
I bet she was real pleased about that. <laughs> she said, that's I'll give you a figment of imagination. Go that's what non-duality, <laughs> that's the perspective of non-duality. Everything is your own mind. <laughs> your imagine. So I was, yeah. she went back to sleep. You know, so. You're lucky. <laughs> You're lucky that's all she did. <laughs> so, non-dual experience, people think everything is, beside the consciousness or the vastness or the uh, beingness of uh, non-dual condition, everything that manifests is not only unified but not really real. It's sort of uh, creation of, of, of the consciousness. There's no re real people, no real cars. They're all one picture that, that as Sargadatta said, that consciousness is the greatest painter in the world. The whole world is, is a picture. So that's true. All that is true. From non-duality we see everything is just one thing. It's all, all the whole universe, all of appearance, including all people, are one fabric. And that, but this fabric has variations in it. It has designs. And this design is all what we see, what we experience in life. And part of that design are living beings. And those living beings can know what I know. And can know consciousness too. Can experience uh, the non-duality. And because of that, there can be non-dual relationship in the sense, first of all, one in the non-duality can relate to somebody who is not in non-duality. I do it all the time. Can relate. Yeah. Yeah. You can, I mean, well, uh, you do it all the time, you, but you think yeah. they can relate. Well, that, that's an interesting question. I mean, there are probably relationships in which, well, there are billions of relationships in which neither partner has an yeah. inkling of, of non duality or interest in enlightenment or awakening or anything else. Right. There are probably some relationships where one partner is fervently interested in that sort of thing and may actually have awakened, but the other is not and has right. not. And then there may be others where both are interested both and both are. have awakened. Yeah. So it'd be interesting to sort of compare and contrast the quality of the potential yeah. so, quality of so, relationships in those different scenarios. So we could discuss all of those. That's a very good classification. So as I said, you know, most people are not living in non-duality. So you know, if I'm not living in, in a monastery or a cave, I interact with people who don't know what non-dual is while I am being in non-dual or even some other more odd condition, right? And that's really yeah. where the, the knowledge of what it means to be the fullness of being arising within time and space, but not experiencing oneself within time and space is mm -hmm. really important. That that's really the bridge and it brings with it the feeling of uh, the various qualities and sensitivities of what it means to be talking to someone who's not where you are or to be able to know um, uh, to also honor the value and beauty of what they are regardless of how they know themselves mm. so that the personal um, reverence for another being regardless of where they are is is fundamental to relating to somebody Sure, and you know, a person who has a nicely blossomed heart and you know, lots of compassion and all that is going to have a reverential attitude toward everyone and to animals and everything else. But I guess the question is... Um, That's not necessarily personal. You can have kindness uh -huh. and act in a very kind way, but it isn't necessarily particularly re responsive in that moment in a personally contactful way, that that's got a different flavor to it. Mm. So you mean someone with whom you live and with whom you're ex extremely familiar, by, is that what you mean, you're implying by personal here? No, oh, okay. by personal I mean a quality of consciousness that makes you feel like there's actually somebody there, that there's someone there, not just a, con not just a compassionate presence, but a compassionate presence that it's like a feeling of I'm here with you in a compassionate or strong or to the other person. 
attuned to the qualities and the capacities of where the other person is. Mm. To it's be like personal, a, a a you have to acknowledge, recognize, and experience and feeling who is the other person, what are they about, where they're at, and responding to all of that makes it personal to them. Yeah, like they're a person yeah. in their own right wherever they are. Yeah. And what I am is, and, and there can be some contact there. Like when you're personal with somebody, you feel there's a contactfulness. Mm. So you're talking about the capacity to really tune into and empathize with whoever, whomever you're interacting with uh, and not just be acting out of habit or, or um, you know, with any kind of constricted awareness, but to really appreciate the depth of the person as, and their individual expression. And, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And, and it's not just a matter of not a habit. Also, not in a generic way. And people think if somebody is enlightened and they're loving, they just love everybody generically. Because mm. there's love, so there's love for everybody. Why, by personal here, we mean there is the, the generic, the, the universal love for everybody, but it can't be personalized so specifically directed to a particular person mm. in the way they need it. Yeah in the way they need it. There are teachers, non-dual teachers, who don't know how to do that mm. because they haven't developed the personal capacity. Right. So we're saying the personalness is a quality of consciousness. Pure consciousness can manifest a particular quality we call personal that allows universal non-dual consciousness to be personal with a particular person. Yeah. But actually, it might be important to mention that we see there's sort of two lines of awakening. One is an inner awakening, that inner aloneness where you are in touch with the ground and the nature of being, the presence. There's another line that's more of a development of that individual consciousness that develops and matures and becomes, well, at first it becomes an ego structure but we see that as just a, not a mistake, not as a bad thing, but that it's an arrested development in a sense. And that we need to continue the development of the person onto being impressed by being itself, mm -hmm. to go beyond and into new areas of capacity and fullness and, and presence. So you're a person of presence that has the capacities to function in the world and has the relational capacity. That awakening, the first way, is not necessarily a relational development. It's an inner identity, uh, awakening to what you are as an identity. The other is more of a, how does that get expressed personally through this conduit? So that's what we're talking about when we talk about, I mean, that's why I brought it up to begin with, because you have to really know what it means to be in the moment as a person before you can actually have a personal relationship. Mm. And we begin wherever we're at regarding that, and we can use relationships to actually help one another mature. I mean, I think everybody here has been in a relationship, you run into trouble, you either work it out with somebody and you kind of move into another level of, oh my god, I didn't think this was going to work out, but actually I feel deeper, I feel more in touch with you, I'm feeling more my love, you get vulnerable, you have to be real, you have to be willing to take that next step and really talk about how you feel, and something starts to change and grow and develop, and you either become aware that you need to separate, maybe, that really isn't working with the two of you after many, many, and many of these things you're learning about one another, or we're really coming together in ways we never imagined. So there's something growing, there's something changing, there's something expanding between you. And that's how we feel relationships are incredibly valuable tools for mm -hmm. dual awakening instead of uh, as one, as really the relationship becomes one vortex of, of being. I have an old friend that I've known since the seventh grade and he got in touch with me recently and told me that he and his wife of 28 years or something were getting divorced and, and the explanation he gave was that well, we just ran out of steam 
And my thought was, well, I mean, you, needed to, you need to keep building up ahead of steam, you know, uh, mm -hmm. to use the steam engine analogy. Uh, and if you're not kind of replenishing and augmenting the steam, so to speak, uh, on a regular basis, then it can be depleted. Um, and just one more little bit on that is, is that if, you know, if you don't have the steam, <laughs> then there's a tendency to want to get steam from the other person. In other words, to, the relationship is about <laughs> taking. And if both people are taking, no one gets. But if both people are giving, then both receive. So there has to be sort of an abundance of, you know, an overabundance of steam. I don't know how we got into steam. Uh, <laughs> my friend's analogy. It's getting interesting. Yeah, has been over Tell me about the steam. If there's an overabundance of that. I like steam. Then, you know, my cup runneth over. And, and there's, yeah. there's, you know, you have enough for yourself and more to give. Right. But we also have needs. And those needs we want to have met. Mm -hmm. And that can create a huge... Uh, implosion that puts out the fire when we feel like our needs aren't being met. So there's a lot of different dynamics that can come into it and people do grow apart and that does become a real thing. Legitimacy. But also, yeah. I mean, it, dynamics between in relationships are so powerful and there's so much to understand there. Mm. But it can be used to fuel the fire of truth, to really find out what the truth of the relationship is and not just let's really work on it so we stay together. No, let's work on it to find, if you're really interested in realization, you have to be interested in what's real. And that means between two people. Mm -hmm. And what's true might not be what you wanna have happen or what's the most comfortable thing, but it'll end up being the right thing mm. if you're both really interested in that. So for me, it's not a matter of how do you keep one another together, or how, but how do you use it to really optimize what's supposed to come through the two of you, or the, it, which is really in a relationship, you can become one. So one that you can't tell yourself apart from the other, not in a merged way, but that you feel it's like a, a, a well-oiled machine when it's working well. I mean, if, when you fall in love, you feel like you're really, intertwined and dancing the same dance and you're responding and it's it's a beautiful dance and then something happens and you go what the hell happened to that you know it was so perfect <laughs> and it brings out all the stuff that isn't that way and and then you work your way back mm. to it but I could chat on for I know you and I are so <laughs> well, so so let's, let's get, let's I'm get sorry. Me to change. one, one, one thing to to remember is that uh, Karen talked about individual consciousness, mm -hmm. which, which can develop and mature, and which is part of spiritual development. Spiritual development has the awakening to a true nature, and the individual consciousness that's always learning and developing and able to manifest different qualities, different skills, and all of that. Now, a relationship is itself a a uh, unified consciousness. When there is a, a relationship becomes real, the two create a field, mm -hmm. a unified field. And thus unified field become like a living consciousness on its own that can stagnate or can grow and develop. And it grows and develop if the two actually work it out, as Karen said. So I wanted to bring in that a relationship is like a person. Mm -hmm. a, a relationship is, is, is a, a being on its own. Yeah. And, so it's, and it can be more alive and more dead. It can lose steam, mean, you know, just like a person loses steam and they get depressed. Or they become more alive, more lively, and more discoveries and more openness. And, and that way the field itself expands. At the beginning, it might be just a small field between two people. But if the two people are really learning and expanding, then they both can get into non-dual experience together yeah. and both be in an non-dual place together, you see. And that will, will be an interesting thing for a relationship to, to, to happen. So we need to talk about a real or true relationship apart from, uh, which is, so when we say non-dual, it's, it's a large category. 
that includes something like a true relationship, even before people know what is non-duality, in the sense they are real, sometimes people are real, emotionally real, and they're honest with each other, and they're really uh, there with each other, and sometimes there is a sense of presence, a sense of consciousness there, even though it's non-dual. And, but that can develop all the way to non-duality. And relationship can grow through all of those stages mm. and further, yeah. I wonder if the two of you would like to speak from your personal experience. You're both married, right? And yes. so far we've heard about your wife being an illusion in, in the yeah. middle of the night. Um, <laughs> yeah. But do you, do you feel like, um, are, if, it's, if you don't mind my asking, I mean, do, you, do you both sort of, do, do your spouses have the same sort of zeal about enlightenment and awakening and all that that you do and uh, and if not um, has that created difficulties or if if they do then what sort of uh, blessings do you feel that that has brought to your respective relationships yeah that's a, that's a good question <laughs> 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 Do I want to say more? <laughs> be careful because this will be online. Well, <laughs> who goes yeah. first on that? Yeah. <laughs> so, my wife been interested in the inner work from the beginning. That's how, that's how we, we met, actually. Right. We met in a work group, you know. So she definitely is interested and, and is developed, and she's a teacher herself. Oh, a diamond you know, approach teacher? She's a diamond approach teacher. Okay. She's just not the same development that I have, you see. You know, so there, there is a mutuality, a recognition of each other and the qualities of each other, but also recognizing how the relationship has evolved throughout the time. There were times there were, there was intensity of being in love and the usual thing that people have. And then became more mature as just two adults who respect each other and, and their quality. And there are difficulties. There are things that she does that I still don't like, I don't like her not to do. And sometimes she doesn't like the way I, I, I do things or my choices or the way I talk to her. And, so all that still happens, you see. And um, funny how when those yeah. things happen, though, they're l much less a figment of your imagination. <laughs> Somehow, yeah, yeah like, you can talk to a figment of your imagination. <laughs> what the hell? What? <laughs> and you go, oh yeah, but. Um, <laughs> I mean, one thing that's been awkward at times that we've actually all had to really work with is that Hamid and I, throughout the years, have had a very intense friendship that's very unusual and that the work has developed through. So we have a great, I mean, nobody knows one another the way we know each other. Yeah. And it's very strong, and we have a tremendous desire to be together a lot. Yeah. And so that's put pressure on very, in various ways. You must have very strong marriages, actually. I can't imagine yeah. too many marriages in which people would have the latitude to be able to yeah. do something like that. And it, it puts pressure in various ways that mm -hmm. um, we've had to work through and manage and so on. So I don't think we're a good example <laughs> of, of what's possible for everyone, but I do think it does bring to highlight how, I mean, many people have very strong friendships outside their marriages. That can cause all different kinds of difficulty. People expect to have everything happen with one other person. And the fact is that you have many relationships in your life and each one plays a very important part. I knew Hamid since I was 22. And the minute we met each other, it was like, click, mm -hmm. that's it. And it was, it's always been that way. Yeah. And we didn't marry each other. We didn't, I mean, there, there's a way in which we were following some, some kind of force that did not put us in that situation, that we had feelings for others. And 
marriage wasn't part of it, but we have a kind of bond that's extremely unusual, and it's got a tremendous amount of power to it, and really we see that as it's for the work. Yeah. And, and so there's define many... Define the ordained arrangement I here. don't know. I <laughs> we don't we know. sometimes wonder, how come we didn't get to go that route? Yeah, what? Get what? We get, go that route to getting married. Oh, right, yeah. yeah. Why didn't we do that? Well, you know, sometimes we wonder, and one of the ideas we have, probably we would have gotten too busy with kids. <laughs> Could be that. Instead of developing the teaching. Yeah. And you getting see, involved. We don't know, but that's, you know, one possibility. One of the yeah. things we see that actually puts the fire out with p some people is getting involved in the practical details of life and comfort, security, all of the things that our instinctual level deals with to get established. And so working through those instinctual things is very important for people to be able to have shelter and work and all of those things. But there's a lot of libido that gets lost in those things. That's, that's the question of steam. We sometimes. didn't have that yeah. Yeah. issue yeah. Of, of establishing house and home and division of labor and, you know, that kind of stuff. So I think that, that's some of that. But that's but you it. mentioned libido. Who knows? Um, getting yeah. lost in those things. In your case, libido wouldn't really be a practical or useful. Um, yeah. We see libido as showing up in every relationship. Mm -hmm. That with your girlfriends, I mean, you get together and you go, oh, God, that looks really good on you. I mean, you get all excited and, oh my God, you've got to have these shoes with that and, you know, or whatever you do. Um, but so it's, it's a like a libidinal thing. It's like you get excited and, and women can be very touchy with one another yeah. when you're, there's comfort, there's holding, there's lots of different things. Or there's the erotic if you're, you know, your sexual orientation is, is mm -hmm. toward a, another woman. Then the men, they have their own way of dealing with their erotic nature with one another, the mm -hmm. things they get excited about. Right. Chest bumping and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. Actually, <laughs> the, the, what I wanted to say was the question, steam, losing steam. What I notice in many relationships, especially marriages, they lose steam because of the power of uh, the instincts, the instinctual needs. Survival, mm. safety, uh, companionship, and all, all these things that, that become institutionalized in a marriage and stamped by the state. Right? You're married, now your bank accounts are connected, your mm -hmm. retirement account, and all of that. So, so the relation in time, it seem, becomes dominated yeah. by taking care of the, those external, physical you know, concern and needs at the expense of the libido and the energy. Mm -hmm. And that can kill the energy and the libido. Yeah. Because it's like we're comfortable together, we're fine in the sense that we're living together, but there isn't the liveness. There, the love itself sort of uh, can stay there in a little sweetness, but there isn't that passion, and that uh, power of attraction, because those other things, especially as people get older, uh, they're very important, as yeah. you know. I mean, and that's why divorces are so difficult. And separation it can be very painful and disorienting for people because, you know, the whole field of the relationship is, is not just a psychological, emotional thing, but has all kind of physical ramifications and safeties and support and all of that. And that's why a lot yeah. of times people, to be able to have the intimacy, they need to actually get away from their life. They go on vacation and then they can look in each other's eyes over candlelit d dinners and feel spacious mm -hmm. rather than actually practicing together, working the issues out, not distracting themselves from it, but finding time to be together and work yeah. in a way that brings <laughs> in their realization of, of being to the relationship and take risks. People stop taking risks is what I notice. They don't challenge the relationship in ways that brings the life to it. They stay with comfort, they stay with um, all the security and don't say, you know, 
this isn't working for me. Am I willing to risk all of that for the truth of what I'm actually feeling? Um, and sometimes it's little risks. It's not like, okay, I gotta dump the whole thing. But we need to be willing, just like in our own realization, we need to let all of that go to be able to find something new there, rather than trying to get back to the same place all the time. The same thing happens externally. We have an idea of the relationship, a, a sense of what it was, and we try to get back to it instead of, this isn't happening. What's happening? What's going on for us? Instead of, let's try to do that again. No, let's find out what's here and dip into that together. And that's a very risky proposition mm -hmm. because you might not find anything or you might not find what you want to find. And that's hard for people. What Hamid was saying about the sort of mundane practicalities kind of dampening the... It can. Yeah. Not it's always, like, but... You know, I mean, Think of it, Let's, we all have a spark of genius and, and you know, imagine that Steve Jobs had to work on an assembly line stamping out widgets for eight hours a day or something like that. It would be extremely frustrating and stressful and, and it would kill the genius in him, you know? And so, and yet widgets have to be stamped. And <laughs> somebody's gotta do it. So it seems to me that, uh, and you know, pra the practicalities of life, uh, we all have to deal with them. Yeah. And so somehow there has to be a way of um, replenishing and uh, the the genius in us, and, and I mean the emotional genius as well as the creative genius, yeah. and in in the face of and in spite of or in the midst of um, the the mundane practicalities that we all have to deal with, it, it's kind of like being able to sort of have uh, you know both simultaneously rather than either or. Right. Well, there's also some elements needed for a relationship to actually take hold in this way, which is a real commitment to one's own willingness to go in and practice, mm -hmm. but also the willingness to really see the other and not just the projections and the ideas and the, the things that are... And there, there's so many things that we put on another person that aren't really who they are and we begin to we need to peel those off of somebody and be yeah. willing to really listen to them and hear them and not just want to be seen by them but want to see them and being uh, having realized non-duality does not remove those projections automatically mm -hmm. one can be non-dualistic realized and still project on individual people mm -hmm. different things that's one thing we, we've learned. So non-dual realization does not delete all our psychological baggage, including our relational baggage. So one thing, for instance, you know, important that we're discussing related to our connection to Karen and myself, for instance. Um, one thing we discovered, how uh, the spark of the connection continues is, as, as Karen mentioned it, letting it go. Several times in our, I don't know, 30, 40 years we've known each other, we thought, that's it, you know, we, one of us confronted the other, didn't like something, and were mad about something, and we thought that was the end of it, and we, yes, we, we, we both gave up on it, we <laughs> don't know what's going to happen next. It's called the death of the relationship. Just like there's ego death, there's the death of a relationship. It was dead. We did, as far as we're concerned, we're dead. We don't know what, what's going to arise after, after that. And from that death, what arises after that, what we discover, we discover what is the real relationship? What is it? What is our relationship really? What is the connection? What is the nature of that connection? That's what we discover through the death, and that went through several s stages, death, many deaths, you see. And that is the thing that most people in relationship are not willing to do. Mm. They're not willing to let go completely of the relationship, believing if they let go, it's gonna be gone. Doesn't, just like when you, uh, with the ego death, it doesn't mean you're gonna die physically, although it feels that but way. But you actually feel yeah. like it is. It I mean, feels like it's gonna die physically. At those junctures, I thought, okay, this has all been great. Yeah. I can't imagine life going on without this friendship, but that looks like what's happening. 
grief comes, all the stages, you know, feeling frustrated about it, angry about it, grief, hurt, all that, and then it's like this, it, different levels of emptiness kept showing up. And then something started to build again. Well, what are you feeling? Well, I'm feeling this way. And that's actually how we began to discover different ways of experiencing reality. So Sounds we began like to use the relationship actually for our realization. Sounds like it was sort of a shifting of gears. Yeah. I mean, you can't shift into second gear until you pull it out of first gear and, and yes. so on. You know, and, there ha and there's a kind of an intermediary stage between first and second and second yeah. and third and so on when you're not in any gear there for a moment. Yeah. And you don't know that there's going to be another gear. Yeah. You don't know. <laughs> I mean, just like in the ego death, you don't know this is going to be the end or not. Huh. You, you give up, you surrender, you think that's it, it's going to be the end of everything. And then the illumination arises mm. and there's a rebirth that happens. And you realize, oh, you still exist, but in a different way, as a being of light, as an undual, you know, unity of the universe, or whatever. The same thing happens with relationship. And that's what I noticed for most people, they just don't have that idea. They don't think that relationship can die and be reborn. Mm. They don't know that. They think relationship can get, you know, negative or positive, it goes up and down. But to completely die, completely gone and, and come back again, most people are just, most books actually about relationship don't mention that. And for us, it's really an important teaching about relationship. And that is how, if that happens, the steam is powerful. Steam is the new rebirth of steam, of energy, a different kind of energy, a different kind of connectivity, different kind of love, you know, different, different ways of knowing each other, different things we know about ourselves and each other. And that is a potential of these relationships. So, so we're a runaway realization together. But what I'm realizing right as we're talking is yeah. that that's the way we approached our experience from the very beginning. Yeah. Just wanting to find out what it was. And we kept losing what we thought we were going to run up against. Whatever realization we were in, we'd stay there for a while and recognize essence or any quality of essence and then emptiness and love and all these dimensions. And then we'd wake up one day and it'd be gone. And then we'd want to have it back again. But that wasn't what was happening, so we had to let it go, and then we'd realize another dimension of something. So it's really how our entire process in our solitary realization went. And then at some point, it became much more focused on our relationship and what our relationship was about. So the same thing started to happen relationally and I think part of the dynamism between us is what unlocked certain secrets about um, unilocality and some of the things that Hamid was talking about in his talk. Some of the different ways of looking at things that are beyond dual and non-dual that actually happened because of our relationship. And I think that's part of the, the design or something that was happening that took us to the point of being able to use the duality for the dynamic flow to happen to open things up. It needed a supercharge kind of situation. Speaking of shifting gears, I'm going to shift gears here and throw out something and see where it takes us. Um, this might seem a little strange, but Ro Robin Williams famously said that um, God gave man both a penis and a brain, but unfortunately not enough blood supply to run both at the same time. <laughs> uh, <laughs> too, yeah. I think the same. Yeah, she was smart. Yeah, you know, so she? think Bill Clinton, for instance, or or that you know the same applies to women. They, that astronaut who put on a diaper so she could drive all the way from Texas to Florida to intervene with her romantic rival or something and not have to make bathroom breaks on the way. I remember that about five years ago. So people do crazy things when they, uh, you know, get stirred up. And it seems to me that the energies that are, res that, uh, are responsible for the nourishment and blossoming of the heart are the same energies that are responsible for that crazy stuff. 
And yeah. it's kind of a, a matter of channeling them appropriately and learning how to channel them into higher expressions, perhaps. Not to say that there's anything wrong with the physical expression of them, but yeah. in many circumstances, it's not appropriate. And so if those energies are stirred up, rather than chasing them into the immediate temptation, learning how to redirect them and, and have them nourish the heart and the mind and everything else. What do you yeah. think about that? That's t true Tantra. Mm. Yeah. Actually, so. it's not acting out on whatever feeling you're having, but learning how to hold it in such a way that's not containing it, but allowing the energy to flow and letting that express itself and bring understanding. Mm. You know, people think that we are two. We're not. You mean you and I, or you and her? Yeah, Karen and I. Well, you, uh, the reason I said that is the last time yeah. I interviewed you, you said well, our hearts are one. Yeah, you know, sometimes, but, yes, yeah. I, I was experiencing that. I can experience that again. Yeah. But in general, th there is the capacity to be one with somebody else. That arises, it's, it's, it's uh, the capacity to be one with another. Uh, does not arise from non-dual experience. Non-dual experience doesn't make you feel that. It makes you feel you and the other are not separate. But there are other kind of realization where you feel you and the other are one and the same. Mm -hmm. See? <clears throat> and that is, you can experience this with anybody, with anything. However, Karen and I, we discovered that we are one all the time. We're always the same. To the same degree, or is it... We're Siamese twins. Oh, yeah? <laughs> separated at birth? <laughs> <laughs> Never separated. Huh. Never born. So we, we're, we're one in some interesting ways. Not everybody is going to find that in their relationship. It, 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 but it happens in, in human life that some people, Two people, they can be married, can be friends, they might not even know each other, but they're one. Mm. They're two sides of the same thing. You mean like a soulmate kind of thing? It, it's even more close than soulmates. Mm. It's one soul. Ah, oh, well that's interesting. Uh, yeah. Have you ever had any kind of past life flashes about your, where you both came from? We sort of have some of that, yeah. 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 I mean, I've heard that said that, you know, sometimes a single soul will split into two and occupy different bodies to serve various functions and so on. Yeah, sort of like that. That's yeah. what it feels like. Huh. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, so uh, as a result, we ha it's easy for us to be one. We're sitting next to each other and we, we're, we're one, and different kinds of ways one. Hmm. You know, sometimes we're walking, go walk, walk together, like we just went on a walk, and uh, Karen says, who's walking? <laughs> and I say, uh, nobody. And when I say nobody's walking, I don't mean there are two nobodies. There's one nobody. Nobody, that is one. This is very paradoxical in language. But it is experientially, it's possible to be one without the one being a body, or being an object, but one as a condition of realization. And there are different degrees and different levels and different kinds. You know, that's the thing about relationship. You see, that's the thing, I think, you know, why we called it non-dual. We thought this should be called non-dual relationship. Because people think non-duality, how do you have a relationship non-duality? It doesn't make sense. And sometimes they will teach us, say, relationships are not important. But uh, there are, although many of them are married, right? Yeah. So you wonder what they think of their partner, right? But then the, the question is, people also need, don't know there are other ranges of relating to somebody else, different from the usual, different ways of being intimate, being connected, being in contact, than are familiar to us. There are, there are many kinds. Want to give a few examples? 
Well, Karen talked about the contact, feeling personal contact. Mm -hmm. The other one is the one you remind me when I felt our heart were one. Right. Another example I just gave you that we are one. Mm -hmm. You see, sometimes we are one as one presence. Sometimes we are one as the non-dual universe. We are both the non-dual universe, you see. Without us, we are two, we are neither two nor one in some sense. We are both. There's two in the sense that we're talking, we're two. talking to each other, but there's one, we are the same being. And that same being be non-dual or can be an individual being. You see, so and there are many others. You know, I can, you know, might come up as we talk. But you know, I'm saying the the crucible or the uh, the the context of relationship is rich of possibilities of discoveries of learning about our humanities and our potential, including our spiritual potential that many people don't know about, and the average person doesn't know about, and many people who are involved in non-dual teaching don't know about. You need to go to other ranges of experience to find out. Mm. But I think that for most relationships, what we would say is that love really is the connecting link. And a feeling of an attraction to somebody, whether it's a friend or um, whatever, kind of relationship it is, that love it ha plays a central part of that, that brings people together and makes you want to be close or it, acknowledge the closeness that's there. I mean, I know mothers that actually, they love their children, but they don't necessarily like some one of them. Mm. Or, and they feel bad about it, but they don't like the person that they're becoming. But their love makes them feel they want to nurture them and all of that, and then they can't wait for having the you know, kick them out of the house or whatever they do. But love is part of that relationship. So love is a very common denominator of the person that you want to be around or near or with. But that love can express itself in many different ways. It can mean an intimate relationship with someone. It can mean a friendship. It can, you know, they have different, there's different kinds of love. But that's a very important thing It's a feature of relationships we have. We don't just have the same relationship with anyone. When we're in a total non-dual condition, we actually feel that well-being and openness, goodness toward everyone. But there isn't the specific love coming in a specific way to a specific person. Mm -hmm. So this brings in the whole question of what attracts us to a particular person, what brings that kind of love. It's a much larger question than just, oh, it reminds me of my father or my this or my that. We, we don't know. It's, it's a mystery what draws us. And as we work through the things that have drawn us, if it is mostly based on history, those, if we're really wanting to know the truth, those layers of the onion peel away over time. And as we work through them, we can actually ignite something that's deep within that onion, more central to what's real. But some of us are attracted to people who we know from the minute we meet them that there's a, a surge of yes. There's a big fat yes here and I don't understand it. My laundry list is not happening here. He doesn't look the way I think he should. He doesn't act the way. He doesn't have the education he ought to have. He wears the way wrong kind of shoes. And I'm totally in love. <laughs> I'm in love. And what is that love? It's drawing you to that person and you have no control. There's absolutely no control over who you fall in love with and something else is attracting you. So there's, there's a lot already in usual experience. You don't have to be mystical to fall in love and follow that. Well, you know, as Buddy Holly said, it's so easy to fall in love, but the, the, the trick is to stay in love, but not obviously not in the sort of um, hormonal frenzy that might initially characterize falling in love, but something that would stand the test of time and uh, continually be replenished and redefined as you go along. Mm -hmm. So does the diamond approach um, have techniques or approaches or practices or something to facilitate that? 
Yeah, we have inquiry. Yeah. We, know, you know, we know our main approach is inquiry. Okay. Inquiry. But that sounds like an intellectual thing. No, I think of the, no. the heart as being such an well, important thing. Maybe, maybe you could say something about yeah. inquiry. It's how it's not intellectual. <laughs> okay. And I say the rest. Inquiry for us sounds like a, an intellectual thing. What we do in inquiry is we validate all the capacities of the human being. There's the capacity for discrimination that is a mental faculty, but you have to, for inquiry to deepen into being and actually follow that continuum, you have to love the truth for its own sake. And that has a power to it that builds over time. The more you get in touch with who you are, the more that love is really the fuel and that becomes the dictating force. So that's the beacon, is what's my experience right now? And that brings the belly in. What am I feeling right now? Whatever it is. Whatever I'm feeling, that's what I'm gonna go into. And I have to be able to accept what's here, whether it's a reaction, maybe it's an aspect of my being that's showing up, it's some kind of feeling of reality. Whatever my experience is, I want to know the truth of that. And that is where the heart's main force of love and draw deeper into what that real inner beloved is. Mm -hmm. So it's a love story. It's a, it's a fire. And the more we're on fire with a question of what am I? What does this mean? And who am I? And where am I going? The more you've got the desire, really, that's how we use desire. I mean, that brings in the belly, that brings in our libido of feeling that energy for inquiry. It's not just taking the blade of truth and going into your experience and, you know, kind of circumambulating. No, it's, you have to be, the more you're on fire with a question, mm -hmm. the more you feel like you really want to know. And I will, I really feel like I, I, I've been pondering this and I, I'm experiencing this feeling and I want to know its nature. The more that's there, the more that allows that blade of truth to cut through the layers of the onion and show what they are and peel them back so that we understand the situation. But it's not an understanding with my mind, it's an understanding of, oh, there's impressions and hurts and wounds and feelings that start to flow out and as we see those and understand them we experience the opening to something else hmm. but it has to be really fueled by the love to know yeah. not yeah. just the it's so just it's got to be really a curiosity yeah. Yeah. fueled yeah. In, by love inquiry for us is experiential no, no, ramana maharshi called his method inquiry and the, and the main inquiry is who am i our question is what is the truth of what's happening to me now where am I now? What's going on? I mean, oh, everything. Not just what I'm thinking, what am I feeling, or what's happening in my body, what state I am in. It's trying to find out what is that. And that is continual inquiry that if, if you continue it, it will peel the, the, all the layers of the onion to reveal the underlying illumination. Because the blade is, is yeah. from the inside, and that fervor to know the truth is that that truth rising up we think of it as the questions that are showing up and we understand them and then oh something emerges that helps to deepen and you have an insight when actually something's moving through bringing the questions that's tickling the mind the heart and the body to open to it if we look at it from the outside in it looks like we're having curiosity and we're interested and we're loving the truth but actually this this arising is our nature coming to the fore that's throwing those things out like breadcrumbs to follow in kind of yeah but this started you're asking whether there is a method about work with relationship and I wanted to say inquiry but it's a different kind of inquiry it's a specific inquiry that has to do with a relationship we call it dialectic inquiry, in the sense that two people, like you and I, 
are inquiring into our relationship at the present moment. What's happening now? What are we feeling? Do I like you? Are you scared of me? Why? What's that about? Are we both feeling the same thing or differently? What are they? That is, we call dialectic inquiry. A dialectic inquiry requires, besides the individual inquiry, which Karen talked about, which involves heart, body, and mind, all of it together, it requires a mutuality, mutual respect, mutual consideration. It requires reciprocity, that people reciprocate, not just one person engaged. It requires uh, openness to mutual influence. To usual influence? Mutual influence. Mutual influence yeah. If there is no mutual influence, there is no dialectic inquiry. I have to be willing that to be influenced by you, mm -hmm. and I have to be willing to influence you. Yeah. And so we, when we interact that way, there is an inquiry. And so the dialectic inquiry is an interaction and a living out of the, of the, of the relationship, but in a way, by, uh, not only living it out, living it out to find out what it is, to let it grow, to let it develop. So let's say that, hypothetically, my wife and I were to decide to go and to Berkeley and yeah. and get involved in the diamond approach and we heard you explain all this and yeah. then what kind of what would you send us home with to do on a daily basis to actually to actualize what you're saying and, and actually make progress I said some of the element to it when I first taught dialectic inquiry I spent 10 days retreat mm -hmm. each day each meeting two meetings a day each meeting was a different element of it it's pretty involved teaching. Mm -hmm. It has many factors, facets, to what needs to be looked at. There is responsibility. We have to be responsible for ourselves, and responsibility for how we impact the other. I mentioned respect. There is a valuing of oneself, a value. There are many things involved in dialectic inquiry, and they're not all easy for most people. Most people are, you know, to be responsible for themselves in a respectful way for the other person is the mature thing to do. And not everybody has that kind of maturity. So it's a, it is a practice, we call it a practice because it takes time to learn how to, it's a skill to develop. But it also, if, it also requires that you have a certain level of uh, knowledge of what you are on your own. So if you flew out to Berkeley to get involved in the Diamond Approach, what you'd find yourself doing is getting involved in a group that would teach you practice, or a teacher that would, a personal teacher maybe. Uh, we have different ways that we do it. Um, but uh, someone who would teach you practices and meditations on your own and work with you to get you in touch with yourself. Mm -hmm. The dialectic inquiry actually evolved down the road. It isn't something that just showed up and it became part of a development of the individual consciousness that we were talking about earlier. So you would learn more about what it meant to be in touch with your essence, what's you, and be able to speak from there and to be able to have some development of the more personal level. Mm. But, um we have about 10 minutes left and we want to take time for questions. I could keep coming up with questions. I could follow okay. up that with a question, but I want to make sure that we give the audience opportunity to ask yes. something if they want to. So um, anyone have something? Uh, the guy in the back with the red shirt and the vest? Yes, I have one question. Wait for the mic. Okay. Yeah, the microphone. Um, yeah, I have a following question, namely that uh, I discovered recently, you see, that what gives a strength to my love is um, that there is involvement also on another plane. That is to say that me and my lover, apart from loving each other, in addition to that, we are both passionately interested in something. And then I found out that that what made this very strong, very strong loving connection. Can you say something about it? I'm not sure I understood that. I think they, they share a mutual passion for something, uh -huh. and that has 
kind of solidified the, their connection and you know made made their relationship more solid. Is that what you? Yeah, saying? that's what I'm saying. Yeah. That, that suddenly we found that there is sure. apart from love, yeah. okay, yeah. we also got together, like say for example, into 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 teaching certain kind yeah. of teaching, okay, yeah. and it is this Thank process yeah. of. Uh, uh, of working together on something else that absolutely strengthens that love between yeah. us. Well, the, if I'm understanding you correctly, getting involved in something passionately, especially when it has an effect of enriching you per each personally on your own, actually it enriches both of you at the same time. To actually have that, um, like for Hamid and I, what really stimulated our relationship and allowed us to actually let it go at times was the fact that we loved the truth more than we loved what we were going to get from each other. And that that truth was the core of our teaching. And that we loved the teaching, we gave our life up for the teaching, we've given up many things in our life for, for the teaching. We will continue to give up many things in our life for the teaching if it comes to whether it's going to be good for the teaching or just good for us. It's whatever is going to be good for the teaching. And that passion about that actually is what our relationship circumambulates around. So to have that kind of passion for something, especially when you're discovering new things together and discovering truths about yourself in relation to that, that has just a flowering effect. And always just being focused on one another for that is Again, the two tips of the iceberg trying to connect when actually you're wanting to go into something else that's, that's really connecting both of you. So I think that's yeah. great to have True. that. I, th I think that kind of passion you talk about uh, is really what happens in many good friendships and many good uh, collegial relationships, people working together. Collegial. Collegial relationship. And they are involved in studying the same thing passionately. It, uh, an interesting relationship develops there. It's and can, it can be a lifetime relationship. Yeah. You see. Uh, okay, we have several questions. Well, Mike Lady can decide where to take it. Mike Lady. <laughs> So I'm also a, a Diamond Heart te um, teacher, no, a student for about the last two and a half years. So I love the inquiry process. One thing I'm curious about um, is when you mention one soul, and I've had similar experiences with various different people in my life, and I'm wanting a little bit more description of what that looks like. And my experience has been that I was so connected to certain people that even not being in the room with them, I could feel their presence and their presence could be talking to me. And it was different than a soulmate re relationship. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more about the one soul relationship in relationships. And if, if possible, let's try to give concise answers so we concise. can get two or three more little. questions. Let's see if we can do that. You're good yeah. with that. Without, Go I, I, yeah. I remember the when we we didn't always know that we, it was a discovery it was a spiritual discovery at the beginning we didn't like it we didn't want to be one everybody want to be our we wanted, i wanted to be myself she wanted to be herself we wanted to be autonomous beings so it took a while you know for us to accept the fact that we are we are one so people who like being one from the beginning, I wonder what kind of one they're, they're talking about, whether it's really real. The real oneness we're talking about is very challenging, very scary. Most human beings wouldn't want to. Because I think people want to be themselves. And they think themselves mean autonomous, autonomous yeah. singular. And so to be one, which can happen, is first of all, we need to know it's challenging it's scary, mm -hmm. and it's rare at the same time. But it does happen. I think yeah. one thing I can say briefly is what you're talking about, too, has to do with a loving connection with somebody that mothers and their children or parents and their children often feel 
they're connected. Twins very frequently will feel things that are happening. So there's different kinds of connections. So it would take a long time to explain all the different ways that, but it might not be one soul, but it might be knowing the presence of somebody else in a way that connects you to them. I don't think, you know, there, there are few instances in history when that was the case about one soul. One uh, famous one that I remember is Rumi and Shams. Mm -hmm. That's an example mm -hmm. of how a spark happened between two people. And people thought they were two people. But when Rumi, the way Rumi talks about it, you could mm -hmm. see some places how he and Shams are one. Mm -hmm. You see? There's a line from Rumi which goes, uh, be the friend, then you can eat from a poison jar and taste only clear discernment. Yeah. So my question is about this dimension of the friend, not a friend or friendship as a category or a special case of relationship, but a, of a dimension in relationship that comes and goes. There's a there's an ebb and flow to it. So, for instance, my son and I are not friends, yeah. but there's a dimension of friendship that can yeah. go up and down. And a similar experience with uh, students and colleagues that some quality or dimension comes in and it has its own elusiveness and fragilities. And, um, and so these thoughts have been arising in. Uh, witnessing your relationship, and I'd love to see you reflect on that. Yeah. It's a natural thing for that to happen, that there is an undulation, friendship, marriages, all that, that uh, ebb and flow. But uh, when the relation, the question is, what is the actual relationship? Not what the people feel about it, not what the two people think about it, but what is it really? When you remove the beliefs and the ideas and the history, what's left? You see? And that, sometimes we're aware of it, and, we, and that can act, but sometimes we get busy or we get uh, distracted by other things, or we get involved in other things, so that proceeds, you see. And when it recedes, it's a different kind of relationship can do dominate. But the, the, the thing about, you know, all kind of relationship, any kind, you know, whether par parent and child, friends, collegial, student, teacher, is what is the true relationship? Because most people, they, what they know about relationship is what they think of each other, what they feel about each other, not the ontological presence of the relationship itself. What is its reality? And, and we are saying it is possible to find out and to know it. Hi, thanks so much for all of this. Hamid, we, I'm Lissa and this is Dennis, and we yeah. listened to the Conscious Love program that you did for Sounds uh -huh. True which was really helpful for us because we met about two years ago and have had a very unusual relationship. Um, not a romantic relationship, but a, a very st strange um, relationship yeah. that w it, was, it was helpful for us to hear that program. Yeah. One of the questions that, that we've had, and this has been one of the real struggles, is that we've had a lot of what I now know is called telesomatic events where, for example, Dennis is in Peru doing an ayahuasca medicine journey and I'm throwing up in California having no idea what's going on with me. Or I'm breaking up with my boyfriend and feeling devastated and he's having chest pain. Um, when we don't know, you know intellectually that these things are going on and it's been quite terrifying. Uh, when you were talking about the autonomous being and that yeah. You know, that feeling of like, we don't want this. I don't want to be yoked to this person who's having, making choices and then I'm having consequences of them. And so yeah. it's created a lot of challenges. I just wondered if you could yeah. speak to that at all. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be interviewing this lady in a while that um, had this profound, rather spontaneous awakening. And her cousin 
also had a very profound spontaneous awakening at the same time. Yeah. And um, she, had, she was in a social relationship context in which she was able to get understanding and, and support and her cousin ended up in a mental hospital. But it's interesting that the two of them had this sort of soul connection or something that caused them both to pop yeah. at the same time. So I mean, and you guys have this soul connection yeah, that, that we're talking about. To us maybe you do too. So you know, maybe there are people who just have this bond yeah. that they're not aware yeah. of what the roots of it may yeah. be, but they go through this kind of thing. Well, he, he, Dennis wound up having a spiritual emergency. Yeah. Um, At, shortly after we met, um, Dennis had a spiritual emergency, and we worked through all of that and had to get a lot of support and had no idea what was happening. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it was well, it would take a lot. My, I, I feel I'd be a little bit. Um, ahead of myself to say, oh, I know what that is. But uh, I would say, obviously, there's a, an important connection, and it's important to inquire into that meaning to stay abreast of what's happening, to actually see what it is that's uh, occurring, and see what you can understand about it, and um, how much of it is the connection how much of it could be other things simultaneously? I mean, there needs to be patterns that, if you're really going to be scientific about it, to really not just jump to a conclusion, but to actually see what kind of patterns they are, how they emerge, in what ways do they emerge, and try to understand it and get in touch with, well, what is going on? Actually, when we're together, what do we experience of one another? What is happening in terms of our consciousness right now? And see if you can find those elements. Yeah, relationship, we need to remember being one is just one kind, rare kind. Most relationships are two people yeah. interact. That's what relationship means. And we need to value that. We talk, this whole interview is, we're making that important. It, that relationship have their own value, their own truth, their own value. They have their uh, creative uh, value, but also value for the inner work, mm -hmm. for the develop for development of both. Mm -hmm. Any kind of relationship, collegial, friendship, marital, but just relating two people or a group people together, they can have a relationship. As we know, when there is a group involved in a project, like in meditation or doing something together, that creates a field. That's powerful that everybody benefits from when we become involved in. And that's a kind of relationship. Like everybody here. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, a conference like this yeah. creates a, a whole that's more than the sum of its parts, and energy gets generated. There's a saying, towards the end of the 10th mandala of the Rig Veda, there's a saying that an assembly is significant in unity. And um, yeah, there's a whole beautiful thing, um, but it has to do with you know, kind of a, a, the group of the enlightened coming together and something yes. very profound getting generated from that that wouldn't mm -hmm. be generated were they just to be individually scattered around. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we're just about out of time. Um, any final thoughts before we wrap it up? Thank you. You're welcome. Nice talking with you. And, 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 and it's good we have though. people this time. Yeah, we have some people. We, get people. Um, we have a question. It's, it's nice to have everybody here. Thank you. And I just yeah. want to say, I'm always interested in the practical thing, you know, so, I mean, people are going to be listening to this in South Africa and Thailand and in Australia, all yeah. over the place. And yeah. so should they basically just, if they're interested, read your books or is there anything more they can do without having to travel to Berkeley or what? Well, we uh, just opened a program of Diamond Approach online and we're going to start putting things through that. So okay. because we notice there's lots of different disparate things about the Diamond Approach on the net and we're trying to bring things together and really put out the trunk of the tree instead yeah. of having all these leaves everywhere. <laughs> so we're putting out the teachings in a way uh, through the, um, but, but the book, approach online. The, the books are good. The book we wrote, we wrote together, The Power of Divine Eros, is a lot about relationship, really. Yeah. Right. A different kind of relationship. Yeah. Yeah. I hope we talked yeah. about enough of the points yeah. of that. I had a whole lot of notes here that we didn't yeah. get. Yeah. And people can, can learn a lot by mm. reading that book. Yeah, and yeah. what is the erotic yeah. nature of yeah. relationships of yeah. all kinds, not just yeah. intimate. So I'll link to that from the BatGap website. And is there anything else? What's your main website you'd want people listening to know about? The, the DiamondApproach.com uh, uh, or something? Uh, uh, at the present time, Rodwan.org. Rodwan. 
R I D H W A N. Yeah. R I D H W A N. And we're in the process of rebuilding it at the moment, right. and we're going to have Diamond Approach Online go through it. But uh, that would be a good place to start. Okay. It won't be hard to get in touch if you if people want to do it. Yeah. yeah. They, they can figure can it out. Add, you don't need to go to Ber Berkeley. We do it in New Zealand, Australia, all over the world. Okay. Yeah, there's groups everywhere. Okay, yeah, that's good for people to hear, because otherwise yeah. they might just give yeah. up or you know lose yeah. interest yeah. or something that they thought they had to but travel. Can we go to Berkeley? Yeah, you can go to Berkeley. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> You're yeah, welcome to. We're popping up everywhere, like yeah. Starbucks. Can we see you in Berkeley personally? Is it possible to to see more of you? Of your teaching, live teaching? Is it possible? We we do live teaching sometimes. We have lots of teachers too. And we have many teachers in our system. So, so there's we, different we, groups. There's different yeah. events happening. We have a teaching school, so yeah. we have many teachers. The two of us teach some groups together and. Sometimes we do public teaching. I think there's a new group not. developing right now. There's some flyers oh, yeah. upstairs that yeah, the yeah. teachers sent along. There's a new group going to open. So you can take yeah. that information and. Yeah, and I'm, that's I'll, one be, way. I'll be involved in that teaching that group too. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Okay. And like anything else, I suppose the more you get into it, the more you can sort of interface and you know. Yeah, there's no way to unpack climb up the all of it <laughs> in one hour. <laughs> right. For yeah. sure. It's just a, a taste. 50 year endeavor. Like we haven't <laughs> discussed yet the different realization, different from non dual, how relationship happens. Yeah, that's a whole that field. That's a whole other thing. That's a whole field, occasion. yeah. Right. A whole field, you see, yeah. yeah. Okay, well, thank you all for coming. Thank and you. And